So I uh, stumbled upon this question. The question is, what is the longest canal in the world? So sometimes, as a Western video maker living here in China, you stumble across things that sort of force you to ask questions. So I stumbled upon this question, which is, what is the longest canal in the world and where is it? Often, it makes me realize that you get a very biased education when you're living in the West and when you're learning in the West. Now I get that because there's just no way that you can be taught everything. So obviously education in the West should revolve around your country and the histories and politics that affect you, your country and that continent, the continent that you live on. Now I understand that when you do specialise in education you do hone down and learn a whole lot more about the world. For me, the alternative is to travel and be curious. And if there is one thing that I've learned now that I'm getting a little bit older, is that having curiosity, being curious, is a very good, honest trait to have. And as far as I'm concerned, curiosity in my book did not kill the cat. Canals are a big part of history because they were the best way to move goods around and they drove a lot of commerce and wealth. And in the United Kingdom, they were very pivotal to the success of the Industrial Revolution, which drove a whole lot of the late stages of the now long gone British Empire. I grew up living next to a canal system in Scotland. In fact, Scotland has an absolute superb canal system up north. It's called the Caledonian Canal. It's in the north of Scotland and it cuts right across Scotland and joins the west coast to the east coast. And interestingly enough, it actually takes in Loch Ness, where the Loch Ness monster lives, in that, that canal system. So it actually cuts into Loch Ness and then out the other side into Inverness. The Caledonian Canal helped boats avoid going around the north coast of Scotland, around the whole top end, which is just not where you want to be if you're a sailor. It's a bit rough up there. Um, and I've been in that canal system up in the north of Scotland, the Caledonian Canal. Um, shared it in one of my Scottish videos. In fact, I'll leave a link below. And I recommend if you're in Scotland to visit the north of Scotland and the Caledonian Canal. Actually, while I talk, I'm going to show you what I seen when I walked that direction because I'm going to go that direction when I cut this video and go for a further walk around and obviously to share with you because it is a very, very nice area. It is extremely peaceful here. I mean, look at it. It's not the best day, I've got it, so it's a wee bit chilly, a bit moisture in the air. But get back to canals. In Europe, the use of canals were also adopted in the same way as the UK. In America, they didn't use canals in the same way. I think there's a, a, a big canal up near New York around that way but they in America actually used the old iron war horse or the train it's known as. They drove America's industrial revolution by laying a whole lot of railroads and they laid a lot of railroads. Um, unfortunately they haven't been keeping that up to date over the last few years have actually declined. The railroads has kind of declined a little bit um, partly because people moved into the motor car. So the other canal systems that you, you learn about when you're in Europe or in the UK and you're learning history or current affairs, the two that you learn is uh, Suez Canal and the Panama Canal, mostly around politics and current affairs. The Suez Canal is often taught or remembered for the Suez Canal crisis, which was when the Egyptian government nationalised the canal 
and that was the main route for oil going into Europe, that caused the French, the British and the Israeli armies to attack Egypt and uh, almost brought further conflict between Russia and the USA and that was about 1958-59. It ended, it was all calmed down by the USA telling the British, French and the Israeli armies to get the hell out of Egypt and that, for me, was the beginning of the end of the old colonial empires of the French and the British. So the other canal system that you get taught, dogs fighting over there, but the other canal system that you get taught um, in schools in Europe is about the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal was almost built by the same French guy, a guy called Ferdinand de la Cips. I think that's how you say it. He actually built the Suez Canal, but he almost built the Panama Canal first because he started the Panama Canal project, but then it was too difficult and he actually gave it up and he handed it over to the American engineers. In fact, it was an American railroad engineer that finished a guy called John Stevens, that he finished the Panama Canal in 1914, just at the start of the First World War. Anyway, the Panama Canal is now owned by Panama, it used to be owned by America, obviously they funded it. But I actually remember this incident um, when America invaded Panama in order to dislodge the president at that time, a guy called President Noriega, who apparently he was a real bad dude. And if America was going to end up handing over that valuable stretch of water, they weren't going to hand it over to a country that was being run, run by such a bad dude. So they invaded. and. Noriega, after a lot of sound control, where they bombarded him with music, he got bumped into jail and then slowly the country settled down. And in December the 31st, 1999, I think it was, they handed the Panama Can Canal over to the control of Panama. And Panama, as a country, now gets most of the revenue um, from the, the canal, which is a good thing. See, America can do good things when they've got their moral compass set in the right direction. So I showed you what was in that direction, I'm going to grab my bag and head off on that direction, take you with me and go and have a, a look, a further look around this park and I'll finish up this video by explaining to you where I am and I'll answer that question, what is the longest canal in the world? Despite their size and history the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal, these systems are nowhere near the longest in the world. They are very long canals, but they're not as long as others. There are very, very long canals in Germany. There's one in the UK, um, a long canal in New York State. There is also one in India. And the second longest canal is in, wait for it, Turkmenistan which is 854 miles long. But the longest canal system in the world is actually here in China. And I'm walking up the side of the longest canal system in the world. It's called the Grand Canal. And it's, it's actually 1,104 miles long. Let me share with you what it's like. Obviously just this section here in Beijing because I don't have the time to walk the full 1,100 and odd miles. That's for fact. So this is the Grand Canal and it was built over a few thousand years, almost 2,000 years I believe. It was actually started in 
486 BC. The canal actually connects two main rivers, the Yellow River here in the north, and it connects back into the Yangtze River, which you'll probably know, is in the south. The essentially basically joins Beijing city in the north to Zhejiang province in the south and it was really key to the commercial success of China over many different dynasties. The canal has something like 24 canal locks where it's set for raising different heights of the water as you can hear something happening over there. So it's got something like 24 different canal locks and 60 bridges or so. Even right up to this day, modern day, it actually plays an important role in ensuring the stability of the country, the economic stability, and it's actually still in use today. Um, it's a major means of communication transport and supports a lot of the small towns and villages and their success and how they interact with many of the waterways that feed into the canal all the way through uh, China, basically. I've read back there that the Grand Canal reflects the ancient Chinese philosophical concept of the Great Unity and it was an essential element in the unity and the, the sort of construction of the great agricultural empire uh, of China down the ages. I can understand that concept of peace and unity as it's certainly something that you pick up, the feeling that you pick up when you spend any time in China and just look peaceful. The other thing that the Grand Canal represents for me, the more I understand China, not that I'm ever going to understand it, but it, it does represent how agile, inventive and creative Chinese people are and their desire to tame the great waterways that flow through China. The engineering over the thousands of years or so to build the canal system has been absolutely outstanding, sort of genius level of engineering. The great thing is that the engineers here that built and designed, tamed the great waterways of China are often celebrated, recognised by erecting statues and monuments in their honour. There's one thing about us humans over the years and that is we do like to build our statues and monuments no matter what country or period in history we're from, we do like to build things particularly monuments and statues and that makes me think of the Stanley Kubrick movie with the opening scene that shows the ape discovering a black stone monolith that appears basically from nowhere I think it's called 2001 A Space Odyssey great movie that very thought provoking I recommend that movie I recommend also a visit to China you will not be disappointed
getting very cold and wet now. The rain is coming down heavier. Not a big fan of the rain, but I did want to come and have a look at that bridge there, which I think is just a very cool and fancy bridge, I believe. There is a really old fashioned sort of traditional bridge over there, which I'll show you in a second. But after that, I'm going to head back to the Metro. Funny thing is when you come out of the Metro, there's a whole lot of um, scooters and stuff. I mean, hundreds of scooters. And that just backs up my claim that this is very much a commuter area where people live here and then travel into the city, Beijing city. The place is called Tongzhou. I love it. I'd like to come back when the weather is better. Don't like the rain. Someone from Scotland not liking the rain. Yeah. <laughs> Right, I'm definitely done now. I'm heading back to the Metro. That's it. I am glad though that I ran up the top of that bridge and had a good look at it because the curiosity was getting the better of me. You know what they say? Curiosity killed the cat. Peace out. Incidentally, did you know that the phrase curiosity killed the cat actually started out as care killed the cat and it means the opposite it means that if the cat was cautious or worried it would lack the commitment and because it's a risky animal and the way it moves around its everyday environment then that caution that hesitation could put it in danger so the original phrase was care killed the cat so it means being careful killed the cat i prefer that version because i would rather be curious and curious curiosity it's a good thing.